I give you all. 
Yeah. Ernestine, you can sing, girl. I'm telling you, thank you. We have a new, yes, we have a new web page. And I don't think you can get to it with what we have on our bulletin. You know, we're, we're struggling. We praise God for the saints who are with us and who are doing what they can to help. But if you want to access our web page, and we are headed in this direction with all of the videos that have been taken in this church over the past 15 years, and eventually with all of the audio tapes that have been recorded in this church for the past 46 years, then you'll need to go up to our web page. And at this point, it is www.shbcheights.com. And uh, I've got a brother who has been helping me with that. I, I need help here. Uh, but uh, one of our saints has done a marvelous job in uh, recording, documenting the sermons, the videos, the audios that we have made in this church over the past. She has volunteered for 19 years and uh, will be honored sometime September the 24th uh, by her family. And I am joining that family and saying this lady needs to be honored for her faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we have in the bulletin here, uh, I just haven't had the time to get there and to make the changes, uh, but it is SHBC uh, Heights, uh, dot com, Southern Heights Baptist Church, uh, dot com. Now, Omari read the word of God to us this morning from the book of Revelation chapter 15. How are you progressing with your reading through the book of Revelation? Success, failure, quit a long time ago? Well, don't stop now because Revelation is a book that speaks to the issue of what's coming up next, what's on the calendar, what are you bracing yourself for. I have my notes, but I didn't want to pass them out to you. But I shall follow them as closely as I can. We watch on the news and we see what's going on in Israel, between Israel and the Palestinians. And you think, oh, well, that's in a distant land. I don't need to be concerned about that. Wrong. We cannot do anything to stop what Israel does. The media is very critical of them, and they have made some serious mistakes. The United States supports them, and I support them not to the point where they maim and kill children. But when a group like Hamas hides its weapons in homes and nursing homes and in places where children are, and they persistently launch those missiles at the people in Israel, Israel has a right to defend itself and they are very, very wise. And those underground tunnels that come right into the nation of Israel with machine guns and all of those other equipment uh, should not be. Uh, there should be a truce declared. There should be peace. But when you're in the midst of that, what is going to happen? Now, if you are an astute believer in Christ and a student of the Word of God, 
you will notice in the book of Revelation chapter 15 that this term occurs here, that uh, this war, which is called the Third World War, will be so brutal until we cannot comprehend the message that the Bible gives to us where blood will flow in the valley of Armageddon up to the bridle of a horse. And I don't know whether that's a figure of speech. Some of it in Revelation is a figure of speech. But it is so horrible until we turn our head and we say nothing like that could ever happen. What's going on now, and I'm not trying to be a Jack Van Eppie, you know, from time to time I watch him and I was on the staff kind of when we brought him to Fort Wayne in uh, 1971 or somewhere uh, but somebody just called me I didn't pay the bill uh, but uh, Jack Van Eppe is a uh, is a student of the Word of God and he can quote more Bible than what I could ever read and I thank God for him but one thing you can do is you can know that what is happening in the Middle East will ultimately affect Fort Wayne, Indiana, the United States of America, and the world. So don't take your eyes off of Israel. It is, in fact, that fig tree that started in 1948 and has been blooming and mushrooming and they've gone through at least three wars and we have visited the land where those wars took place and we've seen the devastation but the worst is yet to come all right so look at your map your geography and see where russia is in relationship to israel and the nations that will join together, according to Ezekiel 38 and 39, and come down on uh, the nation of Israel. And this is going to become what is known as the Battle of Armageddon. When yes, there will be blood. I, I'm thankful to the Lord and I'm preaching that we won't be here. He's going to take us out of here. And I believe now more strongly, having read the book of Revelation and having seen what the Bible actually says that corroborates this three and a half year period when this Antichrist, this man of sin, talked about in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and mentioned again and again and again in the Word of God where this man of sin will sit in the temple and call himself God. And when the 140 and 4,000 people say, I am not going to call you God, I know what the word of God says, and that's where this war will break out. He will say, you worship me. And we know now that no man should ever worship a man. Hello, notice, call him your pastor, call him your bishop, call him your whatever you want to. We don't worship men. And the reason why we don't worship men is because of what I find in the book of Romans. The fact that man is depraved, man is a sinner, Man seeks his own good and not the good of others. Therefore, don't worship a man. When you worship a man, you will discover that he will deceive you. Well, it's hard to stay on topic here because Romans deals with it. And Paul could say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. You ungalitso, my, I am not ashamed of this message of good news. I am not ashamed of his death, his burial, and his resurrection on behalf of sinners. And Paul sets up that scenario in the book of Romans 
where he says, how can God who is holy and perfect and righteous ever take a sinner into his kingdom? And God faces the dilemma. I don't think God's ever faced a dilemma in reality. He's got the end from the beginning. But God says, okay, I figured it out. I figured out a way to declare man to be righteous and not for me to put my own hands on him in going into court and defending him because he is a sinner. He deserves everything that, 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 that the nation would give him because he has broken my law. He has done everything contrary to what I want him to do. So rightfully, he could be punished and sent to hell forever and ever and ever. And how did God solve that problem? Well, I'll tell you. In eternity past, uh, Hebrews chapter 10 kind of explains it. Where you hear the Lord saying, the Lord Jesus saying, I will go down and I will redeem mankind. And since I am equal with God in every possible way, I will take on human flesh. I'll become a man and I'll walk among men. And I will take the penalty that God the Father should put up on sinners because they were born in Adam. And who did that? His name is Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. He walked among us for 33 and a half years. And he was totally God, as Dr. John Whitcomb used to say, 100% God. And yet on the other hand, 100% man. That's the God man. The only time when you can cross him. He is God, he is man. 100% in every possible way. And you hear him cry out on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And God forsook him because in his human nature, God had to punish sin. And yet God not put, did not put his hands on sin. God allowed the sins of the world to be put up on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he died to pay the penalty for my sins and for your sins. And you read about it in Romans 4.25. And in Romans 3, 25, I believe also. God took upon him the sins of a lost world. And in Christ, God judged sin so that any sinner now who opens his life up and says, Lord, I believe on Jesus. All of his sins have been paid for. He is cleansed. He is made as righteous and as perfect as God when he takes Jesus Christ to be his own personal savior. Now, if you haven't done that yet, please do it now because this is the day of grace. And during this time called the church age, Grace is operating. Sinners can come to the Lord and ask for his forgiveness and God will forgive us and cleanse us and make us righteous in his eyesight. Now does that make a sinner perfect? No, it doesn't. Although we are justified, we are declared righteous, but we're still imperfect. We are sinners, but we have been declared righteous by God based upon the sacrifice and death and atonement of the Son of God, the Lamb of God. When you trace that back through the Old Testament, you'll see the atonement was always there. Aaron the priest was to put his hands on what? A lamb. 
And yes, he was a, to be a male lamb, healthy and strong and fat. And he used to put his hands on the lamb and they would take the lamb and they would kill him. And they would take the blood from the lamb and put it up on the mercy seat. Wow, what's, what's going wrong here? Put the blood on the mercy seat and when they put the blood on the mercy seat, what did God do for the nation of Israel? He passed over the sins of the nation of Israel for one more year. And the high priest had no seat in the temple in the Old Testament. Why? Because he went in, he gave his offering, he sprinkled it up on the mercy seat, and he got out. But this man, Jesus Christ, according to Hebrews uh, 11, I believe it is, Hebrews 9, Jesus went in to this holy of holies. I was looking at a picture of what man thinks the holy of holies must have looked like just last night on my computer. Went into this holy of holies and, and Jesus offered himself and he offered the blood from Calvary. And he said, this blood is my blood, and I offer this blood on the behalf of all of those who will believe the gospel. Hello? You're not saved because you're so good. You're not saved because you've never made a mistake. You've never sinned. You're saved today based on the mercy and compassion and grace of Calvary. Amen? No sinner will ever applaud the fact that he, he went to heaven. Well, must be doing some kind of preaching. The devil is trying to stop me. <laughs> no sinner will ever applaud that. Why? Because Jesus, the Lamb of God, died for me, died for you. And it's his blood that was sprinkled upon the mercy seat. And God, when he saw the blood, he passed over all of the sins of the nation of Israel for one more year. But this man, Jesus, when he went into the temple, what did he do? He sprinkled, yes, his own blood. And then once the blood was sprinkled, he sat down on the right hand, which means God's authority and God's power and God's special place by his side. You know, most of us are right-handed. I'm sorry for those of you who are left-handed. <laughs> I happen to be right-handed. And most people, I think, happen to be right-handed. But if you're left-handed, then take your left hand, all right? But this right hand of God was the position of power and authority, the position of taking charge of the entire universe and ruling it and governing it. And that's where Jesus is today. He's at the right hand of God, having overcome, having conquered sin, and immorality and he says to those who believe on him yes I will accept you into my kingdom and you can become my special person well what we read in Revelation is just awesome every time I get here I want to preach it all over again <laughs> it, is, it is just just awesome but here's what you have in uh, Revelation chapter 15. You have the fact that Israel is the vine, but the vine ran wild. And they did not produce what God wanted them. And so Jesus comes and he says in John 15, I am the true vine. Israel was a false vine, but Jesus said, I am the true vine. And the true vine is going to give himself for the sheep. And uh, Jesus now is the true vine. 
of, our, of, of salvation. The second thing that you see in the book of Revelation 15 is that God is going to establish a kingdom upon this earth. And this is where uh, I differ with some of the people who say that the church now has become the extension of the nation of Israel. You see, the church has always been the church. It is that ecclesia, it is that called out body of believers in Christ. God spoke to my heart, and God has spoken to your heart, and you said, yes, Lord, I want to follow you. Then you become a part of the church according to Acts chapter 15. You are called out body of believers in Christ. Called out from what? Called out from the world. Called out from entertainment. Called out for living a life of pleasure and joy. Called out from satisfying yourself. You're called to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're called to worship Him and adore Him and admire Him and to commit your life to Him. Am I talking to myself up here? We are called out body of believers. Yes, I am different from the man who visits the nightclub, from the man who needs to be pumped up with all of this other stuff that's happening in our world today, where the church probably in 30 years won't be a church. You'll just have places where people gather. It's, it's the nightclub, it's the Jay Leno, it's uh, all of those other entertainment places where you come and applaud one another. It is not a place that where Jesus Christ is worshiped and praised and where we give our lives to him. I challenge you this morning, wherever you are, if you hear this in Radio Land, pray for me. Amen. Let me know you hear it. Send a gift to help support it. Amen. I cannot stand still and just see the church go down the entertainment corridor. But that's where we are today. And I, I thank God for Christian businessmen who are willing to put their money on the line to do what they can to bring Christ to our nation. I praise God for those men. I pray for them. But let me tell you something. The church can never be led by billionaires, by people who have money to burn and can buy whatever they want to buy. That is not the church. It is not producing a crop of believers in Christ. The modern church has produced a crop of impotent so-called Christians, if we are Christian at all. Self-seeking, self-satisfying, looking to please what I think I ought to have in life. That is not Christianity. Hello? <laughs> Christianity says I have a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm going to live for him. God will establish a kingdom upon this earth, but presently that kingdom is ruled by the devil himself. You read about it in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. You read about it in Ephesians chapter 2, 1, 2, and 3, where he's called the God of this age. And this God of this age loves entertainment, loves self-pleasure, loves self-satisfaction, loves to please himself. That's the God of this age. Hello? You say you can't have any entertainment? Oh, yes, you can. But it should be something that brings glory and honor to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This kingdom that uh, Jesus is going to build, it will not be of this world. Oh no. He, he said in John 18, 36, I believe it is, my kingdom is what? Not of this world. And the world cannot build the kingdom of God. It's the Holy Spirit of God working in the hearts and lives of men and women and calling them out from the world, saying, you belong to me, 
and uh, you are called to worship and obey and to submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. My kingdom is not of this world. For if it were of this world, then would my servants do what? Fight. We jump on the team with Peter. As soon as they came up to arrest the Lord, Peter grabbed his sword and he whacked off the ear. <laughs> now don't look at me, I didn't do that. <laughs> bow, bow, bow. I, I'm, I'm looking around and I'm saying, what's going on here? <laughs> His kingdom is different from your own plans and your own ideas. The kingdom of God, amen, as God told Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be, what? You must be born again. If you're not born again, you're not in God's kingdom. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how much influence you have. If you're not born again as a believer in Christ and born again people are equal. No, I don't have a billion dollars, but I'm equal to the man who may have a big billion dollars who is a believer in Christ. I don't believe this stuff, this snob no stuff, you know what I mean? I, I can treat you like I want to treat you and, and, and humiliate you and embarrass you because you don't have the money I have. Hello? What does the Bible say about that? Yes, we're equal as believers in Christ. And I'm grateful to God for men who will invest their money to try to make Christ real. But uh, let's make sure that that is what is happening. Well, we talk about this, this battle of Armageddon. The nations of the world are taking the path of Armageddon to total destruction. Look, if you will, uh, what the Word of God says. This word Armageddon, it means uh, the third, I'm saying the third world war. I may be a fourth one, I don't know, I can't set dates and times. I'm not going to try to do that. But it is coming. And uh, when we talk about Armageddon, we're talking about a time upon this world that is going to be indescribable. And I believe that the church will be in heaven when that happens. We will call him the Lord God, the Almighty One. Look at 15 and verse 3. They sing. The song of who? Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord? and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of, of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels having the seven plagues clothed in pure bright item and having their sheets gird with a golden band. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bonds bowls full of uh, what? 
wrath of God. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were complete. These seven last plagues uh, supposedly helping to identify this war of Armageddon. Well, when you read the text, it talks about blood for three and a half years will flow up to the horse's bridle. And Revelation 15, 1, 2, 3, and 4, John gazes upon the victors and their song. I mean persecution. I mean undergoing trials and being willing to suffer and to change your ways and your attitude for the glory of God. Notice what it's talking about here. John gazes upon this in, in 15, and he saw coming out of that whole scenario that there were some people who were going to be victorious. And uh, Nike, in producing that shoe, and Nike came out with uh, just do it. And he uses this, it is the, the Greek word is Nike. Just do it. Are you an overcomer? And I have in my notes, and I didn't give it to you, all the time this word appears in the book of Revelation. It appears again in the book of 1 John. You'll find it in 1 John 4, you'll find it in 1 John 5, and in Revelation it appears there many, many times. Are you an overcomer? Or are you mashed down with the opposition that the evil one will put up on you? I mean, those who are victorious, they overcome the struggles that they may face in life. So are you an overcomer or do you submit to the least bit of pressure that may come your way? If I know the word of God, Christians are overcomers. They are victorious. Uh, the word is used uh, in scripture that talks about uh, being a victor, being an overcomer, one who prevails. Revelation 3.21 and 5.5 and many other times in 6.2 and uh, coming out of Exodus chapter 17 and verse 11. Are we Christians overcomers or do we simply succumb and bend and bow to whatever is pushed down our throat? I think it's time that we say to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are victorious. We are conquerors. We are achievers. We do what it is that God intended for us to do and we do not just bend and bow and succumb. We are victorious, amen? And that's what Revelation uh, is, is really talking about when you study the word in its context. And I'm sorry I couldn't give it to you at this point, but uh, it's, it's in the scriptures. Be willing to surpass what it is that may be expected of you by the grace of God. And John could say in John 16, 33, I have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. You can overcome the world. When you trust the Lord Jesus Christ, walk with him in faith. You can be an overcomer. You can be a Christian achiever. You don't have to submit and succumb to whatever is pushed upon you. God will be with you as you trust him and allow him to accomplish things in your life. Boy, if I could just, uh, <laughs> we reached the day where Paul could say in Romans 12, B 
be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Overcome the evil by doing good. Now, I would just like to jump on this one, and I'm, I'm going to be for your admonition. Evil is all around us. You see murder and violence and children who are abused. You watch television every day, and when you turn it on, right away they're going to tell you mankind has something wrong with mankind. It's wicked, it's evil all around us. And God says, Christians, let me, let me have your full attention. God has gifted every person with something that you can do to overcome the evil in your world. Be an overcomer, be a, an achiever. You see, God did that because he said, uh, good works, that's the way in which we display our faith in today's world. You don't just go and hide someplace. Don't just give some flimsy excuse. I can't do anything to make a difference. Yes, you can. You can do something to work on your job, right? You can make a difference in the world in which we live right now. Your influence makes a difference. Every one of us can make a difference in the world in which we use, we live, uh, that we, 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 we be filled with good works. Acts chapter 9, and a woman by the name of Dorcas, what? What did she do? She sold Lydia. What did she do? She housed Paul and Silas after having been beaten by the Philippian jailer. She put her faith in practice and she did something for it. And uh, we're living in a day, boy, when people say, well, leave Aiden down there in that morass of murder and violence and people are being killed on the, on the door of the church and uh, I'm not going down there. <laughs> yes, God calls you right down here into Samaria so that you can get your hands wet and do something for the kingdom of God to make a difference in our world. I thank God for those men and women who come for the SOS program and try to tutor. But that is not enough. That is not enough just to come to a building someplace and to tutor some kids. We need your support and your involvement in the work of ministry right here in Southern Heights Baptist Church. And I can say that because I've been here for 44 years. Right here, oh yeah, not trying to run, not trying to be somebody special. But we need the support of this community for the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm going to do everything that I can to make a moral impact on this community, on Fort Wayne, Indiana, for God's glory and for God's honor. And I ask you to join me. Thank you, Father, for letting us see that the glory of God should surpass all of the evil and the violence that may be going on in our world. And help us to be, uh, Lord, determined and intentional in terms of using our strength and whatever we have to advance the kingdom work of the Lord Jesus Christ. May we honor you, we worship you, we love you today. In Jesus' name, amen. The invitation is given if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your personal savior, we'd love to share with you how you can know him and live for him for the rest of your days. Thank you. Hello. 
My name is Pastor Otha Aiden. We are the Southern Heights Baptist Church. We are located at 4001 South Anthony Boulevard in the city of Fort Wayne, Indiana. We are announcing the beginning of our Fall Bible Institute, which begins on September the 23rd and the subject on that Tuesday night will be widowed yet continuing to serve. That is a summary of the Bible book of Ruth and I want to